Welcome to CSI Codesville. Today we're looking at part two of a series on fingerprints, specifically classification and individualization of fingerprints. Now you'll probably recall these gentlemen, Will West and William West. We've already distinguished these individuals um, based upon your understanding of fingerprints. But how does that come about? More specifically, how can fingerprints be systematized for rapid identification? That's what this program is all about. Today, we're going to be looking at fingerprint classification, fingerprint individualization, and the use of statistics for retrieval purposes of fingerprints. Now, what you see before you here is a 10 print card. Some of you are already familiar with this document. Uh, it's used to store and record a person's fingerprints and essential personal information. You can see the one behind me is the 10 print card of Lee Harvey Oswald, as you know, who infamously on November 23, 1963, shot John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy, uh, to dead on the streets of Dallas. Keep in mind that fingerprints are not only individual evidence, but they're also class evidence. And we'll see how that works. Fortunately for us, when we look at classification, we can see that fingerprints fit into a relatively small variety of patterns, such as we have here. What we have is a loop. So we have at least one fingerprint ridge that enters and leaves on the same side of the fingerprint. What's more, we have only one delta. You can see there's a triangular kind of pattern that we find on fingerprints that I have circled here. We refer to that as a delta. Loops are going to only have one of those. Now, there are some variations of loops. First, let's look at the radial loop. The first type of loop pattern that we have here is known as a radial loop. And the reason why is because if this ridge pattern enters and leaves on the thumb side of the hand, we refer to that as a radial loop because the bone directly underneath the thumb in the forearm is known as a radius. I'll write it down here. Okay? There's a second type of loop pattern that we see as well when we have those ridge patterns that are entering and leaving on the little finger side. Directly below the little finger or pinky is a bone known as an ulna. And so these are referred to then as an ulnar loop. So to review, a radial loop is when those patterns enter and lead toward the thumb. That's a radial loop. The one that you see still pictured here is the ulnar loop, which enters and leaves in the direction of the pinky of the small finger, the little finger. Great. Another pattern we want to take a look at is an arch. You can see these ridge patterns are going to enter on one side of the fingerprint and leave on the other, they're going to rise in the middle. And there are no deltas here. So these are very easy to spot. Also notice that we have no central region in the middle of this thumb around which ridge patterns are going to revolve. Now the tinted arch pattern, you can see here, we have the same pattern as an arch, as a plain arch, and yet we have in the middle of this a triangular pattern right in the middle of the print, which we are not referred to here as a delta, but because it's in the core of the print, the very center of the print, we're going to refer to this as a, as a tinted arch. It looks like a little Boy Scout tent. That's how it got its name. All right, a third type of pattern that we're going to see, and these are very significant. They're referred to as whorls, where you have one ridge pattern, at least one ridge pattern is going to make a complete circuit around the core. So it kind of looks like a hurricane pattern that you would find on a weather map. What's also true about whorls is that there are at least two deltas. You can see 
one on the left and one on the right in this world here. Worlds, however, have some variations to them that I want to indicate to you. Another one that I'd like to point out to you is a central pocket loop. Here we have a delta here, as I mentioned earlier. And in a central pocket loop, we have a delta-like structure that's closer to the core. So if you were to draw a line right down through the core in the middle of this you know, hurricane pattern here, these two delta-like structures are going to be asymmetrical to each other. So that's a central pocket loop. Another pattern that we're going to see in worlds is a double loop. So it appears that we have two loops that are kind of wrapping around each other, kind of like the yin and the yang. And then another type of loop that we want to refer to as an accidental. And that's because we may have several delta-like structures in these. Uh, and they don't really fit any other pattern, but we have at least two deltas in those accidentals. They're, they're a little bit more unusual, but you do see them from time to time. Now, worlds are going to take on some significance, so I want you to be able to recognize them. Now, we were talking about systems. Now you notice that we have ridges, we have whorls, we have arches. How we develop that into a system. Take a look at the following. Back in the 1920s, this Henry classification system was de developed for the rapid retrieval of 10 print cards. And what was determined was that a, a value was going to be assigned to each number on both hands. And that would be represented here, that you can see. There doesn't appear to be a pattern, but there's a rationale behind it. And whenever we find the presence of worlds on a 10 print card, we're going to Add these values up, the numerator and as well as in the denominator here. And that fraction that we're going to leave as a fraction, we're not going to uh, convert it into a decimal, that value is going to divide all fingerprint cards, 10 print cards, into one of 1,024 different categories. So that when a person goes in to match a set of prints, if they know the Henry classification number of that card, they're immediately ruling out the other 1,023 sets of 10 print cards. So it's much, much faster. Now, we're going to take a look at the most common type of classification number right here, and that's where there are no worlds. And so we would use none of these numbers that I have underlined here, but we would add the value 1 to the numerator, we would add 1 to the denominator. So this is the most common uh, Henry classification number for people that don't have worlds. Now, let's imagine uh, for the sake of illustration that a gentleman has a whorl on their left thumb. We won't worry about what type. And the right middle finger, and let's say the left ring finger. What would the Henry classification card for that person be? Well, we would take the number four, add one to it, so the numerator would be a five. In the denominator, we would have an eight plus a one plus another one, and that would make that 10. So this individual's classification number then would be five over 10. And again, we don't convert that into a decimal. And yet, with the advent of computers, we're going to develop a whole new system based upon the, the previous system, but for a much more rapid means of retrieval of, of these fingerprint records. Introducing IFIS, the Integrated Automated Fingerprint Identification System, and as you can see, it's maintained by the FBI. It began in 1999. That was based upon an earlier system that dated back uh, to 1980. That includes all prior prints, by the way. Over 800,000 10 print cards um, were made prior to 1980, and this database includes all those. Currently, there are over 70 million subjects in the criminal database. Now, if we include the civil entries into that, there's going to be over 100 million sets of fingerprint and personal information records that are in this database. That includes over 73,000 
known and suspected terrorist. Currently, he is rated at 27 minutes for every submission, every request to get a match on a print that's submitted to the time in which a, a response is given by the system. So in the typical amount of time that it would take for a police officer to go out to the corner to get a cup of coffee and a donut and come back to the police station, 27 minutes, they have a match. So it doesn't take long for the system to work. Regarding statistics, we can use how frequently different fingerprint patterns occur to determine how rare they are. And as you know, that's going to determine the probative value of a given print. Consider the following. The most common type of fingerprints we have are the ulnar loops. And so they would have the least probative value. On the other side of the spectrum would be these arches, particularly a pinted arch. Now imagine, what is the probability, the likelihood, that any given person would have two arches? We won't worry about what type. Keep in mind that typically most people are going to have 10 fingers, right? So we have uh, 10 fingers on each individual. We want to keep that in mind, okay? Now, if we have 4% plus 1%, that makes that 5% or one over 20 of the odds of having one arch. Now, the odds of a person having two arch, we would take the product of those. And as you can see, one times one is one. 20 times 20 is going to be 400. Keep in mind, however, what we set up here, that we have 10 different fingers per individual. So we're going to multiply that probability times 10 so we basically have a 1 in 40 chance or 2.5% chance of a person having two arches of any variety. So you can see that we can take the prevalence of different fingerprint patterns and we can uh, estimate how rare they are or how common they are, which is going to help us in determining the probative value of any given set of prints. Okay, now to fingerprint individualization. We've been talking about class evidence so far. How are we going to distinguish two individuals that have a 10 print card whose 10 print classification number is the same, five over 10 or one over one? We said that was the most common pattern. How do we individualize at this point? Well, when we look more closely at fingerprint patterns, we see within those patterns, patterns of ridges themselves, what we refer to as ridge characteristics, or as you can see, minutia. And I have a chart here, which may be helpful for you to pause the program at this point and make a copy of this table for yourself. If you look below me at this pattern, you can probably spot the different types of patterns that I have shown here. Now, consider the following. What fingerprint pattern appears in these photographs? Do you see any deltas? Now, since you see no deltas, you ought to be able to tell what type of fingerprint pattern that we're seeing here. I'd like you also to take the temper card that you made yourself in class of your own fingerprints and determine your Henry classification number based upon the information you learned in this program. And next, what would be the incidence of, print, of tinted arches in your class? So pull the class, they have all the temper cards made, find out how frequently do we find tinted arches in your classmates. And then consider the following as well. What minutia can you identify here? Can you determine that one is? Here's another one that's identical to it. What would you call this artifact here? There's another one just like it just below. And another one right down here. What would that which characteristic we call. Now, when we look at these artifacts, most municipalities use 12 minutia 
to consider a fingerprint matched. Okay, so they'd have to be in the same location of the same kind of ridge characteristic that we see here. That is going to be considered a match. Now, of course, that's going to depend upon the population. Out in Montana, where you have, you know, one person for every two square miles, they may be able to drop that down to as few as four matches to consider that to be a match in their population. But over here on the East Coast, New York, Philadelphia, this area, Coatesville, where the population density is much higher, we need to have a much higher number to consider a fingerprint a match. Can you name these? Hope you can. And then back to the top of the program to remember these two individuals. Will West, on his fingerprint card, there were seven whorls and three loops. What about William West? Guess what? The same number. Seven whorls, three loops. Can you imagine that? All the measurements that were identical of these two gentlemen, although they're unrelated, and here we have a pattern that could it be identical? Well, remember the Henry classification number? Will West had a classification number, a Henry number of 13 over 32. Now, this would be a real challenge, wouldn't it? Is this is the suspense getting to you? William West's was 30 over 26. Both had seven whorls and three loops, and yet the Henry number was different. Why? Because the seven whorls and the three loops appeared on different fingers. That's how important this system is. Well, listen, that's all the time we have for now. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.